From its tamer shallows to its terrifying depths, I'm fascinated, mystified, and in eternal wonder of the sea. Struck by the secrets it holds and the freedom it promises. Slipping into scuba gear, diving beneath the waves and exploring those hidden worlds myself is a joy unparalleled, but a luxury I can't allow myself nearly as often as I want. I think this is why I'm drawn to media that attempts to capture something, anything, of the majestic terror of the ocean. It's at once comforting and unsettling that any part of our overly explored planet still has the ability to surprise us. Anime is no stranger to aquatic adventures. In fact, it's been somewhat of an obsession for the medium as of late, with the likes of Penguin Highway, Ride Your Wave, and Children of the Sea paying homage to the Blue Planet's namesake. Yet, I found those features to be fascinating but flawed in equal measure. I've been spellbound by their truly stunning sights. Indeed, Children of the Sea may just be the most beautifully animated feature I've ever seen. But that beauty is so often shallow, tempered with strange scripts that fail to speak to me. I was apprehensive, then, to sit down to watch Jose, the tiger and the fish, led as it is by two people completely smitten, in different ways, with the sea. Kumiko is trapped, confined to her house in equal parts by a beastly society and an overprotective grandmother. She paints her way to places she will never see. Paris, the mountains, sunflower fields and decadent patisseries, and of course, the ocean. Elsewhere, Sunio doesn't need to dream. He makes his living probing such realities with only an oxygen tank weighing him down. There's something of the ocean in both of them, each boasting hidden depths that don't reveal themselves straight away. Though their curiosity for the sea binds them, they are opposites. As they often do, these opposites attract, and meet, collide, really, somewhere between the beasts and the sea. Jose, the Tiger and the Fish, is an oft-adapted piece of writing. Originally penned by Psycho Tanabe, and weighing in at only a handful of pages, its multiple adaptations speak to a timeless importance. Written in the early 80s, its obnoxious, horny, and strikingly rebellious lead bucked narrative tropes surrounding disability at the time. Kumiko is slight, but her presence is anything but. She may not be able to walk, but she's never afraid to run her mouth. He'd never met a woman like Jose, whose beautiful doll-like features belied such a filthy mouth. Different directors have teased something wonderfully original from Kumiko's brief template. I'm particularly fond of Chizuru Ikawaki's turn in the role, who refuses to live half a life, fighting and fornicating her way to satisfaction. But what's most interesting with these numerous adaptations, evenly distributed as they are across 40 years, is that they manage to capture our evolving relationship with disability. Her grandmother was very kind, but she was too embarrassed to have people see Jose in a wheelchair, so she took her out only at night. 
壊れもんには壊れもんの分いうもんがあるやろおばあ怖えええか外は外は恐ろしい猛獣ばかり Every version starts with the same catalyst. A wandering salaryman, perhaps drunk, definitely malicious, decides to push Kumiko's wheelchair down a steep hill. The revelation that her accident was no accident is truly shocking. And yet, no version of Kumiko or her grandmother seem particularly surprised. It's a deservedly pessimistic view on society, a product of the difficult time this character came to life. But to see it echoed today is difficult to believe and even harder to swallow. Throughout the film, there are moments where the beast's grandma continuously warns Kumiko about fail to disappoint. The able bodied still tut loudly as her bulky chair gets in the way, or perhaps worse still, ignore her completely as she asks for help. The daily freedoms they enjoy are presented through the eyes of Kumiko, who watches someone running for a train in a crowded station with a fierce and impossible envy. Written in 1984, Jose, the Tiger and the Fish was representative of a changing dialogue in Japan surrounding disability at the time. Just ten years prior, the Aoi Shiba movement was fighting to tear down traditional and pervasive notions that disabled people should simply be hidden away. And just a few years after its publication, Japan would see new legislation that offered personal assistance to the physically disabled. Whilst the anime adaptation is a modernized retelling, Kumiko was still born out of that societal upheaval, and the failings of the past and present, our failings, still temper her character. But for all it has to say on the beastly nature of society, Jose, the tiger, and the fish is, at its heart, a love story. It's a stunning one, too. Ultimately unencumbered by its heavier peripheral themes. It's not just a romance between Sunio and Kumiko, however, but a film in which our heroes fall in love, whilst falling further in love with the world around them. As Sunio is coldly welcomed into the Yamamura family, Kumiko's campaign truly begins. Whilst Grandma gambles away her inheritance on Pachinko, or falls asleep in a sunbeam, Kumiko demands Sunio show her more and more of the world. Sunio begrudgingly agrees, and in doing so, he, and we, see the world afresh through Kumiko's eyes. What sells her wide eyed wonder are the stunning visuals of the film, with each everyday backdrop brought to wonderful life and colour. The picture's various dips underwater represents some sort of ultimate freedom, and it's hard not to be swept away in such moments. Kumiko's journey into a wider world is peopled by a strong cast of supporting characters, not least Sunio's perennially jealous best friend. Whilst their encounters are never as vicious as the live action counterparts, each traded barb cements Kumiko as a force to be reckoned with. Designed by Nao Emoto, the artist responsible for the stark but soft girls from O、oh、Maidens in Your Savage Season, Kumiko shares that juxtaposition in both attitude and appearance. Indeed, with her youthful posturing and preoccupation with her many sordid and potentially fabricated love affairs. <laughs> Kumiko is very much a misplaced maiden, and her own awkward adolescence could have very well fit in with the girls from Marie Okada's Literature Club. Media 
when it deigns to interact with disability, generally tends to idolise its heroes, to lift them up as some picture-perfect paragon who bear their burden with a quiet, resolute bravery. Kumiko, on the other hand, is a wonderfully embittered protagonist, petty, abrasive, and loud. She is scared and angry, and finds solace not in the inspirationally infirmed, but in the self-affirming and beautifully broken heroines of Françoise Sagan. In her walled-off existence, Kumiko can only imagine all the places she will never go, fantasizes about all the lovers she will never take, and reads about all the heartbreak she will never endure. It is no surprise that Kumiko loses herself in books, and it is no accident that her favourite among them is Those Without Shadows, a poignant and particularly French novella by Sagan. She idolises the unflappably resolute and stunningly independent Jose, so much so that Kumiko steals her name and takes it for her own. Kumiko-chan, sir. Jose. Hoping perhaps to take some of her freedom whilst she's at it. Sagan had a habit of naming the heroines in her novels Josie, which Kumiko immediately fell in love with. She thought the name Josie Yamamura sounded so much better than Kumiko Yamamura. She felt as if the name was calling her, telling her something good would happen. The Defiant Library of Françoise Sagan might seem, at first blush, to be antithetical to the artist formerly known as Kumiko. Indeed, her brash, selfish, often vengeful leads don't fit our image of this petite, demure girl in a wheelchair. This contrast, however, is vital to realigning how an audience might attempt to react or relate to Jose, and it challenges the ugly notion that it is a disability that defines someone. In the face of such prejudice, Jose's infatuation with Sagan's heroines, who refuse to be walked over or ignored, is understandable. They represent a different kind of freedom for Jose. In styling herself after these women, who strut unflinching through tutting crowds and wear their scarlet letters with pride, Jose reclaims an agency for herself she has been robbed of. In a culture where she feels she is being hidden away, being denied her existence, or worse still, have that existence pitied, characters who buck societal expectation aren't just compelling or inspirational, they are a life raft. I hope that, in turn, Jose is seen as similar salvation. I think the little goblin has lessons for us all, and I earnestly hope that she inspires everyone in need of a more realistic role model. We shouldn't be expected to be brave or strong. We should all feel like we have the agency and the audacity to be a vindictive little shit. As short as it is, Tanabe's original novel doesn't get too explicit with the meaning of the tiger, the fish, or even the Francoise Sagan of it all. In its multiple iterations, each director has taken a stab at their importance, and in turn, every viewer will as well. The last 15 minutes of ruminations have simply been mine. But I urge you to read, watch, and watch again this strange girl's plight to forge her own path. In her foul-mouthed foray into a beautifully blue world, you'll no doubt find something that speaks to you in unique, surprising, and ever wondrous ways. As always, thanks for watching. This video was a whole heap of fun to make, buoyed by the many excellent performances that brought Jose to life over the years, always tethered 
to Tanabe's brilliant blueprint. I could honestly watch Chizuru Ikawaki slap the snot out of her love rival on repeat and never get bored. A huge thank you to my good friend Isla McTeer, who brought the original novella to such wonderful life throughout the video. And of course, to my patrons, without whom I simply couldn't do this for a living. If you would like to join their ranks and support Beyond Ghibli, please consider heading over to the Patreon and pledging a buck. Otherwise, you can subscribe here on YouTube or follow me over on Twitter for updates about upcoming projects. If, instead, you want me to put my money where my mouth is about that fantastic slap fight, hit the like button and I'll watch it again and again and again.